Happy Wednesday, everyone. My name is Yiling Zhuang. I'm the Water Resources Regional Specialized Agent in University of Florida IFAS Extension. Welcome to the Water Wednesdays. Water Wednesdays is a webinar series about Florida's precious resource, water. Every Wednesday afternoon at two o'clock Eastern time, we'll live stream a 30 minute talk about Florida's water and what we can do to protect it. We host our webinar series on Zoom and broadcast to Facebook Live. We have a theme every month. October is the Agriculture Best Management Practices Month. Last month, we focused on springs. And this month, we'll focus on urban agriculture. Last Water Wednesday, Dr. Campbell discussed the benefits and the limitations of urban agriculture. Today, I invited my colleague, the commercial horticulture agent in Orange County, Ms. Hannah Wooten, to give a brief overview of the growing needs in urban agriculture. Let's welcome Hannah. All right, thank you, Yulene. I am so excited to be joining everyone today. Just bear with me while I get my screen shared and up and running. And my controls hidden. All right. Hello and happy Wednesday indeed. My name is Hannah Wooten and I am the Extension Agent of Commercial Horticulture here in Orange County. And I do work with the urban commercial horticulture in the form of lawns and landscapes and ornamental plants. But I also work with the uh, emerging urban farm and food movement. And it is exciting and interesting. And I'm excited to share some growing needs and opportunities for responsive research. So we're going to talk a little bit about urban agriculture, why we consider urban agriculture. We'll talk about uh, some needs expressed by farmers working in the urban agriculture realm and some opportunities for UF IFAS research and extension and some other considerations beyond that. So uh, urban agriculture is, are practices that include the production, distribution, and marketing and consumption of food and other products within core metropolitan areas and their edges. This includes school and community gardens, back top, backyard and rooftop uh, types of horticultural operations, and innovative production methods from uh, aquaponics to hydroponics to yard farming. Um, and urban agriculture can uh, happen in many different types of areas that maximize output within a constrained physical space. Uh, farms that supply to uh, urban farmers markets, community supported agriculture and CSAs, and farms that are located in metropolitan green belts are considered urban agriculture. So urban agriculture can really encompass um, traditional farms where urban sprawl is kind of encroaching on some of those farms where a number of farms uh, self-define as urban agricultural operations. Um, and then there are some that based off of their production practices by using alternative practices in more metropolitan areas might be defined more so as urban agriculture. So why do we even consider urban agriculture? Well, the global population is increasing from about seven and a half billion to about 11 billion by 2100. And 820 million, uh, almost 1 billion people on the planet do not have enough food to eat. 40% of food is wasted between the farm and the table. That is about 1500 miles on average. This is an issue of the food system, not specifically food production, but it is an issue of the entire food system, including production, processing, distribution, consumption, and waste. Habitat loss is considered a leading cause of the loss of biodiversity. Fossil fuels are linked to US food production from the manufacturing of fertilizers to the transportation and storage of food. And currently 84% of the United States population lives in urban areas. 
And over the years, fewer and fewer individuals claim farming as their primary occupation, and they are providing food for a significantly higher population every year. Um, and it's expected that 75% of the total global population will be urban within the next few decades. And you can see some interesting maps here showing um, the hungriest places on the planet in addition to agricultural, agricultural pr productivity in the form of calories. And um, this is kind of significant as we think about the types of high value crops that can be grown in urban ag systems and uh, the higher value associated with some of those crops and the nutritional quality of those. So metropolitan land. This is a quote directly from a planning and land use book, and it really uh, highlights the fact that our metropolitan counties are the most crucial areas for preservation of agricultural land. One million acres of farmland are converted to non-farm uses annually, yet we have an increasing population. More of that, most of that land is being converted in metropolitan counties where four out of five Americans live and where a bulk of their fruits, vegetables, and dairy products are produced. If you didn't know, Palm Beach County is the most agriculturally productive value-wise in the state of Florida. That is also one of our most urban counties in the state. So um, food is produced in and around where people consume it or can even uh, contribute to the entire food system. And here's a great map of all of the delicious things that we enjoy right here fresh from Florida. So again, why do we consider urban ag here in Florida? Well, Florida is the third largest state by population and agriculture is the state's second largest industry we produce the second highest value of vegetable production uh, in the entire United States, right here in Florida. Our seasons are favorable for specialty crop production. And a lot of those specialty crops are very well suited for alternative types of systems or going from farm to table uh, in restaurants, things like that. Less than one quarter of 1% of Floridians are farmers. Half of them do it full time. So considering that we are that productive agriculturally and that few individuals are carrying something so significant to the state's economy and environment is pretty huge. 12% of households in the state are hungry and food insecure. Half of our drinking water goes to watering turf grass lawns. And in 15 years, if we don't plan, we might not have enough water to continue to sustain the population growth and the community needs that we anticipate here in the state. So the good news, we, we do grow enough food to feed everyone. We just waste it. So just remember that uh, next time you have something that might be on its way out, try to eat it try to compost food that does spoil. Um, just a, a note that we can, we have some solutions to this stuff already, solutions that we can eat. Um, but I wanna talk about where are the farmers and who are these farmers? Because it's like urban farming, what is that? Well, urban agriculture is definitely happening. Here are some maps from the Edible Orlando Local Farm Guide showing all the different types of farms and community gardens here in and around the central Florida area. And then you can see another map here represented on a UFI this extension website. So you can certainly see that we have a, hand, a, a, a nice variety of some different farms represented in a very densely populated part of, that, of the state. We are that bright red in the center. Urban agriculture is absolutely happening. And these are the farmers. These are farmers using um, small plots of land, uh, farming in a mostly traditional sense. We've got a number of farmers that 
use organic growing practices, but are not necessarily certi USDA certified organic. We have growers that use high tunnels for season extension, as you can see here in a few photos. And then we have some uh, front yard gardens and um, some things that are in some popular neighborhoods where gardens are the norm. And you can also see some examples of hydroponics. We have the World Marriott Center here that has a pretty large hydroponic operation that has expanded into a warehouse that's about a half mile from my office here by the International Airport. And a lovely display of hydroponics from urban smart farms in the Orange County Convention Center. And uh, we've got these locally manufactured farm daddy grow boxes that are completely self-watering, passively self-watered growing systems. Um, we have amazing things that are going on right here in Central Florida. Oh, and uh, including some, some correctional facility uh, growing operations using hydroponics and other alternative agriculture. So these farmers are definitely around and they are definitely growing things differently. And they're doing it by being innovative. We have front yard farming operations. So what, what does this have to do with water and resources in the environment? Well, when you think about how far food moves and how much water goes on turf grass to keep it um, aesthetically pleasing. And I mean, it is nice to lay on a lawn from time to time. Okay. I know there might be some haters out there, but turf grass is the largest irrigated crop. So utilizing water and space for vegetables instead of turf grass um, is certainly something to consider when it comes to water quality and quantity and how we use our space. We have local small farms that are pretty traditional in nature, but they're doing intensive cultivation on small plots of land in and around urban areas. And they're delivering their produce harvested at peak freshness and nutrition and bringing those to markets and to local restaurants. They're doing things in areas that um, where the soils might not be as ideal or they might have uh, had construction equipment parked on top of them at some point in time but through composting practices and good agronomic practices, these local small farmers are figuring it out. And the numbers that they share sometimes are pretty incredible with how much um, income they're producing off of these small plots. And then hydroponics. On average, the same yields can be produced as conventional agriculture using 80% less space and 95% less water. And then we have operations like aquaponics where the hydroponics and the aquaculture growing fish are combined in a, a closed loop system where very sustainably produce and protein are grown in a closed loop and sustainable system. And this can be done in urban areas. It could probably be done in my cubicle. So, okay, so let's um, talk a little bit about some numbers. Um, I know this is a wordy slide and that's not ideal, but these numbers are truly incredible. And I think everyone needs to pay attention and there is not enough research currently that truly demonstrates or even refutes um, how productive hydroponic production is. I think for research in general, it would be really good for um, our brilliant scientists to look into some of these numbers and either to support them or poke holes in them so that we can make uh, our, our production systems better. But the University of Arizona did compare hydroponic lettuce to conventional lettuce systems. And in terms of yield per area, the hydroponic production of lettuce was found to be 11 times greater than that of its conventional equivalent. 11 times. Hydroponic production uses controlled environment and can consistently deliver, deliver growth cycle after growth cycle throughout the year, resulting in an average of 41 kilograms per uh, square meter per year of lettuce. 
in comparison to the conventional outdoor equivalent of 3.9 kilograms per meter squared per year. That is because hydroponics in a controlled environment can grow over and over and over and over again, and the light and the temperature are not as big of factors in a controlled environment as outside, dealing with the environment and nature and weather. Uh, there's going to be costs involved with that, for sure. Um, but this, this is incredibly productive and can be very productive in small spaces. Nutrient leaching is minimal or non-existent in hydroponic operations, which is incredibly significant when it comes to topics of water quality, when we talk about what's happening to our lakes and our rivers. Uh, not having as much nutrient leaching associated with agricultural productivity is something that's a really desirable benefit. And continuing with that University of Arizona research, they found that the hydroponic production of lettuce uh, does require more energy, about 82 uh, times more energy per kilogram produced than the conventional production of lettuce. So it's not perfect, but these numbers are really interesting. And I think these numbers really um, should warrant a lot more research. This should not be the best document that we have when it comes to comparisons of hydroponic and conventional systems, but this is. Um, so I, I hope that some of you research-oriented uh, folks are curious about this. It's pretty an amazing information. And here is a really nice visual <laughs> representation. Uh, yields per area are significantly higher for hydroponics. So when the yield is normalized, hydroponic production uses an average of 13 times less water than conventional systems. So we're getting um, the same type of productivity, but with less water, which is truly amazing. So this slide um, is from the, a National Geographic article that was published a few years ago, I believe in 2017. And it is talking about how the Netherlands um, really invests into research in, in agriculture, especially using controlled environment agriculture. And you can see that their greenhouses are located in and around their cities. And you can see here that this uh, graph showing the tomato production shows that the Netherlands, a teeny tiny country, um, they produce, they're number 95 globally for tomato production, but they do that in less than seven square miles of space. Um, you can look at the numbers for China where they do produce the highest yields, but they are the least efficient. So hydroponic production and some of these alternative growing systems and utilization of controlled environments can allow us to use our space a lot smarter. I don't know about some of you, but um, the reason that I really started wanting to invest my time and energy in the area of agriculture and food production was because I love nature. And knowing that we have a rising population and that we have to continue to feed people, you know, food or famine, um, do we continue to expand agriculturally into areas that are currently pristine natural areas that we know provide the best ecosystem services? Or do we look to utilizing technology in some areas so that we can maintain those natural areas um, and keep those pristine and natural? And can we grow food smarter in less space like demonstrated here by the Netherlands? So some opportunities that exist and um, some, of, some of these are uh, 
just based off of observation through the years of working in the private industry and working with the university and just being an enthusiast myself. But BMP grant projects on hydroponics and looking at some actual comparisons, looking at water use efficiency uh, could be really fascinating. We talk about um, changing to micro irrigation and things like that um, for water use efficiency projects uh, on agricultural properties, but we can take that another step farther, uh, increase but probably increasing that efficiency by utilizing hydroponics. And there are really a lot of questions right now, some unanswered questions that I know we have the brilliant minds and the passion to lend to, to finding some answers to these questions. Like, um, it are, is using more plastic in hydroponics um, going to outweigh the benefit of the water use efficiency? These are, questions, these are great questions that we still have. In general, uh, addressing food waste so that we don't have to grow as much more food means that we will have less water used um, on food that ultimately just gets wasted. That's a simple one. Um, not all funding agencies look favorably on hydroponic production. SARE, um, since hydroponics does not involve the use of soil, um, SARE does not fund projects looking at hydroponics. But you know, if I had a 10 acre forest property and wanted to be agriculturally productive, I might have to uh, remove a lot more trees to be agri as agriculturally productive as I would if I um, invested in a hydroponic system. So I think these are really important questions and we need to be critical so that we can find the best solutions for the future. And then something that's really, really cool, exciting and is available in the grocery store now are um, breeding for nutrition. Breeding for maximum nutrition, not for shipping and handling is something that um, we are starting to see. You can see Johnny Seeds has this Valentine tomato that is bred for high lycopene levels and high lycopene is a known cancer fighter. And then we have these red and tasties that are Florida grown. And these are also high lycopene tomatoes and they're certified by the American Heart Association. So growing produce that is more specifically geared towards health, not just like fruits and vegetables are good for you. Um, those are all some things that uh, urban agriculture and these more controlled environment systems can allow us to optimize our growing environment so that um, hopefully we can um, achieve goals like enhancing the nutrition in our plants, uh, either through breeding or even how we grow them. Okay, so um, here's a really nice example of urban agriculture that is happening here in Florida. This is the business Calera and they are, uh, they're officially selling their locally grown greens utilizing uh, artificial lights in local grocery stores. And I think the way they tell their story about uh, being an urban ag operation is uh, pretty cool. So hopefully I've got my sound and everything hooked in right. Let me know if it's not. In the global imagination, the farm exists as a picturesque landscape between the cities where most of us live. Natural disasters have whittled away some usable land for farms, and 80% of land suitable for farming is already in use. We need inventive ways to feed the growing population as it nears 10 billion by 2050. It's expected we'll need 70% more food. The leafy greens industry in the U.S. ships about 130 million servings per day, and the global lettuce market size is nearly 30 billion. In a struggle to meet these needs, farmers must dump chemicals into depleted soil and treat products with pesticides. 
but leafy greens have a short shelf life. So it's a race against the clock to get produce to market at the peak of freshness. Lettuce has a limited reach in parts of the world, but in the United States, roughly 95% of lettuce and leafy greens are grown in California and Arizona. In traditional farming, it often takes weeks to get product from the point of harvest to customers. This much time can deplete vitamins and potential problems can greatly increase the chances the crop will spoil before reaching the shelf. One in six Americans get sick each year from something they ate, and the E. coli cases from romaine lettuce have increased recently since 2017. Even with the most stringent and scientifically based requirements for growing leafy greens, it's not enough. As the world becomes more urbanized, we need solutions now. Calera is redefining what's possible by leading the way into the next agricultural revolution, where localization of the farm is making a return. The company's high-yield hydroponic vertical farming systems utilize clean room technologies and automation and combine advanced plant science with data science to grow vegetables faster, cleaner, at a lower cost, with less environmental impact without the use of pesticides or genetic modification. Calera has spent several years to develop optimized plant nutrient formulas tracking and adjusting 15 specific components throughout the growth cycle. The recirculating irrigation system uses less than 5% of water used for conventional farming. The company has developed an advanced automation and data collection system with Internet of Things, cloud, big data analytics, and artificial intelligence capabilities. Plant growing parameters such as temperature, humidity, and nutrient levels are under strict control and automatically adjusted. It's simply the ultimate next-gen tech solution for the thriving demand of clean food. Calera's first hotel-installed high cube at the world's largest Marriott in Orlando has proven to be more than a proof of concept. It has confirmed the pick-to-plate future of hyper-local horticulture by providing enough fresh leafy greens for all of the Orlando World Center Marriott's restaurants. Most restaurants are proud to say they source their produce from 50 to 100 miles away. We here are proud to say that we source our produce from 50 feet away. Looking to expand rapidly, Calera built a large facility in Orlando that will produce millions of heads of lettuce a year. Right now, we are redefining what pick-to-plate freshness means for the future. In a sense, we have perfected Mother Nature indoors by combining science and technology with farming. Unlike traditional farms, the plants aren't at risk for exposure to contaminants and pathogens in the soil, water, or air. There is no spoilage, and the product has a shelf life of up to four weeks. It's the freshest, cleanest, and safest option there is for highly nutritious, cleaner than organic produce that can be grown year round. It's perfection you can taste. Imagine a new vision for the future of farming, not between cities spread out over lavish landscapes, but inside cities, in the backyard of bulk distributors, on doorsteps of restaurants, and just a few footsteps away from you. All right, so um, you could definitely get a feel in that video for what is possible, and it is happening. So just very quickly, um, there we did a needs assessment with these urban farmers um, in August of 2019, and we had 49 participants, which truly demonstrates that there are a number of different people that self-identify as urban farmers and urban growers. Um, and some of those primary needs um, that these urban farmers 
can use extensions support on include organic pest control, more classes locally, um, different support about operational costs, marketing, and then things that we can do um, as extension educators include educating the public and policymakers, including tours and field trips. Um, it's uh, funny to note that there was a lot of feedback about too many regulations from a lot of the growers, um, but this really demonstrates that these farmers do exist. They're passionate and they are innovators and they are really looking to the solutions for today and tomorrow. Um, so thank you all so much for uh, joining me today. Um, we certainly have opportunities in research and extension to be able to work with, um, with urban farmers now and into the future. So I look forward to any questions that you all have. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah, for this informative presentations. So if you have any questions, you can just put in the chat box. Meanwhile, for our Facebook viewers, I understand that there are about 10 seconds delay between two platforms. Mm -hmm. So just leave your question there. We'll start from our Zoom participants and then we'll move on to Facebook Live. While our participants are typing the question, I do have one question. That's one picture you showed for hydroponic is vertical. Um, is that common or usually it's uh, still, it's just one layer instead of uh, going up? Um, the most common is having one layer. Um, and it really all comes down to the economics at this point in time, but we are seeing that vertical is becoming more common. And this is something with um, technology, especially in artificial lighting, wavelength specific LEDs are really helping to optimize um, the grower's ability to go vertical. And that ultimately allows growers to increase their potential profit per square foot of space, which is really significant in urban areas. Yeah, I can imagine that uh, in a like a metropolitan area and how it can save space and increase production. Mm -hmm. um, let me check our Facebook. I don't see any questions now. I did ask one question on the Facebook. I'm still waiting for responses. If you consider yourself as an urban farmer, so the same for our Zoom participants, do you consider yourself as an urban farmer? If so, let us know. I'm just very, in, I, I'm just curious to, to know what you think. All right, here, I guess there are some delays on my end. I, I saw a question now. Um, in your opinion, how would you expect the data for Florida to differ from the study you cited from Arizona? That's a good question. Oh, yeah, that's a really great question. Yay, thanks whoever asked that. Um, I expect data from Florida to be less um, potentially, um, up, it could be up to 50% less in Florida, but this is where we don't have, where we have opportunities for more science and more research. But the difference in yield in Florida would be attributed to our high humidity levels and the limitations that we have for controlling the environment as it relates to uh, photosynthesis and evapotranspiration of the plant. Um, in Arizona, in a very dry climate, the plants are able to, the photosynthesis is like really rapid. And the difference between the, uh, the, the drier climate outside of the plant is really what drives um, that increase in photosynthesis um, and 
the, and therefore the total yields and productivity. It also has to do with cooling our greenhouses. It is not as economically efficient to um, inject carbon dioxide into your greenhouse in Florida because we need to ventilate our greenhouses more frequently because of the humidity and the temperature that we um, have to struggle with as growers. Um, that would be my expectation, my opinion, but we, that would be a fantastic research project since we truly don't know that answer. Great question though. Thank you, Hannah. I'm still checking our Facebook. We got some comments, great presentation, very informative. That's what I want to say too. Um, I, I think our Zoom attendees are being a little bit shy, probably due to the chilly weather. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think it's a good stopping point. I don't see any questions here. And again, if you have any questions, you can just leave for, uh, on the Facebook page or send me an email. I will direct that question to Hannah. And thank you again for all your time. Just to let you know, uh, next week, we'll focus on hydroponics. Just give you a quick, um, I will say tutorial how to do hydroponics. And thank you, Hannah, and thank you all. Um, hope you enjoy the rest of your Wednesday afternoon. Bye. Thanks. Bye.